freedom. He whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We never use our liberty as a license to sin, but you don't have to live in a little box that somebody else created for you, always telling you this is the way you must do everything, and if you don't do it this way, then not only are we displeased, but God is displeased too. Do not let people do that to you. You are gonna have to fight your way out of that, and you're gonna have to fight for your freedom and in Galatians 5, 1, it says, once you've got it, stand fast, therefore, in the freedom wherewith Christ hath made you free, and do not be ensnared again in a yoke of bondage which you have once put off. Amen? God wants you to enjoy your life. It's very plain in the Bible. 15, 11 says it. John 16, 24 says it. John 10, 10 says it. Jesus came that we might enjoy our lives. And you cannot enjoy your life if you don't enjoy yourself. And I believe the high call on every believer's life is to enjoy God. I really believe that that's the high call on our life is just to enjoy God. To have a relationship with God and just enjoy Him. And you know what? If you are just petrified all the time that God is mad at you because you're not keeping all the rules, Come on. You know, one person comes to church and says we should pray an hour every day, and the next person comes through and they says we should pray the Lord's Prayer an hour every day, and then somebody else comes and says we should intercede four hours a day, and you've got to do it from five to nine. Now, I came tonight and told you you need to confess scriptures out loud every day, and so. <laughs> and see, the point is, is we need to do all of those things. But you have to be led by the Holy Ghost. If you make a law out of them, and if you want to know the absolute truth, I think there's a little something wrong when we're counting up how long we pray. I mean, you got done 45 minutes ago and you haven't said anything that made sense since then. Because all you're doing is talking to yourself, trying to sound religious and putting your time in so you can write in your journal that you prayed an hour today. I don't know how long I pray. Some days I pray five minutes, some days I pray an hour. I don't know, I don't even pay any attention anymore. And I used to be one of those clock watchers and record keepers, you know. But don't you agree with that? Isn't there something a little wrong with that when we gotta count up how, you know, well, I did this 15 minutes, and I did this 20 minutes, and I did this 10 minutes. Break out of that box. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Enjoy God. It's the high call in your life to enjoy God. I remember all the years that I always just vaguely, vaguely. See, the devil likes to put vague fears on us and vague thoughts. Not just things that are so blatant that we might catch him, but it's just like this vague little feeling that you're just not quite pleasing God. Anybody ever feel that? I mean, you're faithful, you're diligent, you pray every day, but somehow you just got this feeling you didn't do it right. Come on, anybody ever feel that? You know? And you're faithful to read the Word, but then the devil says, well, you can't remember nothing you read anyway. And then you think, yeah, what did I read? I don't... Or then you're faithful to go to church on Sunday and just as sure as I'm standing here, somebody says, well, you know, what the pastor preach on today? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I've learned? It may not be up here, but it's down here. And when I need it, it'll come out. We don't have to be rigid, 
spending all of our time trying to keep man-made rules, being criticized by people who preach and don't practice what they preach. <laughs> so once you receive Christ, there's a life that he wants you to live. Turn to the person next to you and say, get a life. Now, if you go with me for a minute to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6, it says, Whereas she who lives in pleasure and self-gratification, giving herself up to luxury and self-indulgence, is dead even while she still lives. Now, I want to bring this out just for balance's sake, because... It's very important that we always teach the Word in a balanced way. And I'm talking to you this weekend about loving yourself, but I don't mean for you to be in love with yourself. <laughs> There's a difference. This scripture says plainly that the person who is self-centered and self-indulgent is basically no different than a walking dead person. In other words, they're walking around and they may be their flesh may be enjoying everything <clears throat> that they're doing for themselves and the flesh enjoys getting your own way, but the bottom line is you can get your own way and still be very miserable inside. In order for real life to flow through you, in order for the life of God to flow through you, you must be a giver in every way. You must give compliments, you must give encouragement, you must give help. You pray for people who have needs that are way beyond what you could do. You give smiles. You don't criticize. You're not judgmental. You give people a break. You give them a little room to be themselves. You give money to help people. You buy things for people that don't have what you have. You support the preaching of the gospel. You just become a giver. Everything about you becomes a giver. Now, that's vital if we want to enjoy our lives because God is a giver. When you are giving, you're more like God than any other time in your life. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. And he gave his best. And he gave his all. And he gave it freely with no strings attached. And we must learn in our society today, and especially in the Christian culture, that our preaching to people is doing zero good if we're not going to walk in love. That is why the Bible said you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You must love your neighbor, and you must love yourself. You start with receiving the love of God. You let that love heal you. As you receive that love, you begin to accept it and you begin to love yourself. Now you have something going on in here that you can give away. You cannot give away what you don't have. That's why it's just downright foolish to tell somebody to walk in love if they don't have love in them. I tried for so many years to obey the messages I heard in church about loving people and I did not know what in the world was wrong with me because I wanted to be nicer. I wanted to love people. I didn't want to be angry and upset. I didn't want to be selfish and self-centered, but I was. And I knew I was saved. I knew that I would go to heaven if I died, but I did not know what my problem was. And it was more than one thing, but one of the things that was wrong with me was I didn't like myself, so I couldn't love anybody else. I didn't love me. But I was in love with myself. And what I mean by that is I was selfish and self-centered and I was trying every way in the world to make myself happy, not realizing that the way to be happy was to give myself away. Is anybody home tonight? You gotta give your life away. You gotta give yourself away. You gotta give your money away. You gotta be a giver. Well, what about me? 
You don't have to worry. God will always take care of you. If you're a giver, you'll always have more than enough. You'll have joy unspeakable, the peace that passes understanding. Your social life will be radically awesome because everybody will want to be around you. Loneliness will be a total thing of the past for you. And you will so much enjoy the presence of God because now you're created in God's image, but until we become givers, we're not functioning like God. We need to get ourselves off our mind and we need to do it on purpose. And we have such bad habits that at first we're going to have to do it on purpose. So learn to love yourself, the person God created you to be, but don't be in love with yourself. Don't be selfish and self-indulgent. Selfishness stops up the well of life. It's like throwing dirt down a well. Giving gets the flow going. Now, I want to tell you a story. And this, this, well, it's actually, I'm going to tell you about a movie I saw, but this movie is kind of the crux of what I want to say here tonight. And I'll encourage you to, to get it and watch it if you'd like to. It's a movie called Five People You Will Meet in Heaven. Now, I'm just going to kind of tell you the essence of it. It's been a while ago since I watched it, so I may not get every detail right, but you'll get the point. This movie is about a man who just felt like a general failure in life. He just felt like a total goof up, a mess up, a mistake, a do nothing, a know nothing, a go nowhere, a failure. He was on up in years by the time the movie started. Let's say he was maybe in his 60s or something. And um, he worked at an amusement park and it was the last place in the world he wanted to work because his mom and dad had once owned the amusement park, and he always just felt like his dad just kind of wasted his life, and, and uh, the last thing he ever wanted to do was, was be like his dad or do what his dad did. And so he had these big illustrious plans to get away from there and, and go have this other great life that he had planned for himself, but just some different things happened, and, and he never was able to, to get away from there, and so his parents ended up ended up dying and somebody else bought the amusement park and he ended up working for these people and working at this amusement park literally all of his life. Well, he was very unhappy on the inside, but you might not have known it to be around him. He was actually a very nice man and, and helped a lot of people and was, was generous and would help different people that, that worked there that maybe were having financial troubles and things like that, but he just felt like a total absolute failure. Well, something happened on one of the rides and a little girl was about to be killed and he actually, in the process of trying to save her, got killed himself and died and he went to heaven. But when he got there, of course, this being a movie, you know, it wasn't exactly along the lines of scripture. When he got there, he was told that he would meet five people in heaven and that each one of these people that he would meet would be very important in helping him make a final decision that he had to make, which was what did he want his heaven to be like? Everybody that went to heaven in this movie got to choose what they wanted their own heaven to look like and be like. So if, if, you, if you wanted your heaven to be a, you know, an island in Hawaii, you could live on the beach the rest of your life, you know, or if you wanted to, whatever, you know, whatever you, if you wanted to live on the mountains in the Swiss Alps, you could, you could be there. You got to kind of just create your own existence. And so as the movie goes on, he meets these five people, and at first he didn't understand what was going on. And to be honest, it took me a while to understand it too. I almost turned it off twice because it was kind of slow moving. I'm like, this is really goofy. But then I kept thinking I needed to finish watching it. By the time I got to the end of it, it was one of those movies you think about for days and days and days because it had a real message in it. And so for, I, don't, I don't remember the order, but first he met a man that, He'd been in the, uh, in the Vietnam War with, and it turns out that he had saved this guy's life. And so this guy proceeds to tell him what all he'd meant to him and, you know, how because he'd saved his life, what he had gone on to do and all the different, you know, things. And then he met a little girl that when, uh, when she was just like about seven or eight years old, he saw her in the street playing and a car was coming and, and he quick ran and 
grabbed her and got her out of the way and saved her life and then showed, you know, what she went on to do and how she wouldn't have been alive if it wouldn't have been for him. And so they go through, you know, these five different people, each one telling a story like that, and the emotions are mounting and you're beginning to get the point. And so when it comes time for him to pick his heaven, he realized by then that where he had been all of his life, that although he hated it the whole time he was there and always felt he was in the wrong place, that that indeed was the best place for him to be. And so he chose as his heaven that amusement park that he lived in all those years, but always felt like he was on the, in the wrong place and always despised his life. And the message that I want to try to get across to you tonight, you, you need to not only love yourself, but you need to love your life. <laughs> And you need to stop wanting somebody else's life. You need to stop wanting to look like somebody else, have somebody else's gifts and talents, and you need to embrace your life, and you need to realize that the real power in life is in the little things. The little things. Now what I'm saying tonight, if you will embrace this and go home and contemplate this and concentrate on it, it can be life-changing for you. Please, 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 for the sake of Jesus, do not go through your life always wishing for something you don't have. Make the most of where you're at right now. Be a blessing right where you're at. Be the best you you can be right where you're at, and you can be assured that if God wants you somewhere else, that he will put you somewhere else, and there will be promotions, there will be different levels, but let me tell you something, if you don't get happy here, I'm telling you, you won't be happy over here. I know, because I have lived this. It's not about how much money you have, it's not about what kind of house you have, it's not about your position at work or your position in the church. You know something? There are relatively, and of course there's more than a handful, but just for the sake of making a comparison, there's a handful of people that are the people that everybody see and admire and all these things, and most of us are just plain old common folks. in our little niche in life, doing our little thing, and the devil loves to make those kind of people think that they're nothing. But that's the stuff life is made out of. Me being on this platform tonight for these two hours and two hours tomorrow and two tomorrow night, and two, you know, this is my call, this is my gift, and I'm doing this to help you, but this is not my life. <laughs> I have a life. I have kids. I have grandkids. I have a husband. I'm a person. And I go through the same things that you do, and I've learned, let me tell you something. I've learned that it's not what I do up here that's that important to God. It's what I do behind closed doors at home, and it's how I treat people when I go out into the marketplace. It's how I treat people that are in need. It's what kind of a giver I am in my everyday life. And I believe I will be judged a lot more by how I handle myself in those places than anything else. This man hated his life. He, he wasted his life in that he never enjoyed it. That is a tragedy. Do you know that it is a tragedy to be alive and not enjoy your life? That's a tragedy. Worry will suck the life out of you. Reasoning will suck the life out of you. Trying to do something about something you can't do anything about will suck the life out of you. You need to learn what you can do and learn what you can and what you can't do, God will do. Do what you can. Don't try to do what you can't. <laughs> Trying to make things happen out of God's timing will suck the joy out of your life.
We need to know our purpose. We need to know our main purpose in life, and we need to know our specific purpose in life. And our main purpose in life is to fear and revere God, to know that He is, and to obey Him. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, it says that absolutely beautifully. I'm not going to turn there just because of time, but I love that scripture. It says, when Solomon had tried everything, he'd gone through everything, and he'd messed up things so badly, he said, the end of the matter is this. And you know, if you read, if you read what Solomon wrote, I mean, he just basically just tried everything. Women, money, excess in every area. Nothing could make him happy permanently. When it came down to it, he said, here's the end of the matter. Fear God. And we do need to have a reverential fear of God. We do need to know that God is God and that he means business and that he's not just our buddy, but he's God. Almighty God. All-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing. You know what? We're not getting by with anything. God sees everything. He knows everything. He sees everything. Just because we go home and close the door and our religious friends can't see, that doesn't mean God doesn't see.